Let's look a bit more in depth at fieldwork, a research strategy for understanding the world through intense interaction with a local community over an extended period. Let's start with an example. Nancy Shipper Hughes, a professor at the University of California, Berkeley, uh, is best known for her ethnography, Death Without Weeping, The Violence of Everyday Life in Brazil, based on long-term fieldwork there. Shepard Hughes first traveled to Brazil in 1965. Due to severe drought, political and economic chaos, and extreme poverty, she found a lot of infant mortality in the community where she worked. She understood that the miserable conditions of shantytown life contributed to high infant mortality. But what puzzled her was the apparent indifference of mothers to the deaths of their infants. This puzzle shaped her research as she returned many times over the years to conduct field work. A simple solution of sugar, salt, and water could reduce the diarrhea and dehydration that killed so many infants and toddlers. But it was difficult to convince a mother to rescue a child she perceived as likely to die. In these difficult conditions, mothers had to learn which babies to let go of and which ones it was safe to love and nurture. What does Shepard Hughes's research suggest about fieldwork? A middle-class woman from the United States traveled to one of the poorest places in the world, learned the language, lived in the community, built relationships of trust, accompanied local people through the births and deaths of their children, and search for meaning in the midst of pain. The fieldwork experience can become more than a strategy for understanding human culture. Fieldwork also has the potential to transform the anthropologists. Contemporary anthropologists continue to study far from home, but many also study human culture and practice in their own country, including the U.S. By exploring fieldwork, you'll gain a deeper understanding of how anthropologists go about their research. Then, at the end of this module, you'll submit your own short fieldwork observation assignment. Professor Mark Peterson of Miami University has undertaken fieldwork in Egypt, the United States, and India since the early 1990s. He's also taught for five years at American University of Cairo and undertook fieldwork during that time. In total, he spent about 85 months abroad in Egypt and India conducting participant observation and research. Professor Peterson has published numerous papers as well as two books on his research. Connected in Cairo is an ethnography of wealthy and middle class young people in urban Egypt and explores how people engage with globalization. In the 19th century, few anthropologists undertook fieldwork, but by the end of the century, uh, in the beginning of the 20th, in the 19th century, few anthropologists undertook fieldwork, but by the mid 20th century, an extended stay in the field became central becoming an anthropologist. In the 19th century, armchair anthropologists collected field reports from many sources, from missionaries, journalists, and colonial officials. They then synthesized, analyzed, and theorized about people. These reports were often ethnocentric and lacked the same aims as anthropology. Missionaries, for example, were primarily motivated by converting so-called pagans, while colonial officials were focused on enforcing order and putting people to work. By the end of the 19th century, professional anthropologists had begun to visit field sites, but tended to stay in areas inhabited by Europeans. They thus stayed on the veranda and called people to them to conduct surveys and interviews. These methods produce valuable cultural information but they failed to observe people in their everyday cultural surroundings. By the late 1920s, anthropologists began to follow the example of Bronislav Malinowski, pictured here, 
who spent several years during World War I living with the Trobrian Islanders off the coast of New Guinea. Malinovsky and others initiated the practice of participant observation, which involves living for an extended period of time in the place you're studying and participating as much as the locals will let you. The basic fieldwork method of anthropology involves living in a culture for a lengthy period of time and participating as fully as possible in the people's social activities or gathering data. Anthropologists strive to learn the culture of the people they study through fieldwork by living with them, participating, and going through the rounds of daily life. In a given cultural setting, how do people tend to think, speak, interact with one another, and do things? Most of us take our own culture for granted. It's something we've learned through social experience and internalized into our everyday assumptions. We truly begin to recognize the importance of culture when we encounter other people who think and act using different cultural assumptions. In an intercultural encounter, we become aware of our own culturally shaped expectations. Encountering profound, dif Encountering profound difference can lead to culture shock, the sense of bewilderment that occurs when your expectations are disrupted and you don't know how to act in a situation. We can define culture shock as persistent feelings of uneasiness, loneliness, and anxiety that, are, that often occur when a person has shifted from one culture to a different one. Eventually, as we learn how to operate in a new culture, culture shock can give way to a sense of cultural competency or fluency. Many of us experience reverse culture shock when we return home from the field or from extended stays in a different culture. Reverse culture shock is a sense of bewilderment that occurs when one returns to one's home to find that it now seems exotic. When I return from Central Africa, it always takes a while to get used to the relative isolation of life here. In Gabon and Cameroon, people are always available for a conversation or a cold drink. Well, here in the U.S., I spend a lot of time at work and then go back home. How do we deal with profound difference? How do we handle our culture shock? Is itself culturally shaped? We can respond with ethnocentrism or relativism. How we deal with profound difference and how we handle our culture shock is itself culturally shaped. We can respond with ethnocentrism or relativism. When we respond to culture shock through our own cultural lens, our response is obviously shaped by ethnocentrism. The majority of culturally shaped responses to difference assumes that my cultural system is better. It's more reasonable, more rational, more natural, healthier, God-given, and so on. The assumption is that there must be something wrong with these people that makes them act differently from me. Another way to assume that our culture is superior is by feeling sorry for cultural others. We might say, for example, these people don't act like me because they're impoverished, uneducated, oppressed. Even when we point to external causes of oppression, we are frequently asserting our own cultural superiority without being aware of it. When we blame others for cultural difference, we also demonstrate our ethnocentrism. If they worked harder or strove to be less ignorant, they could be more like us. We might also consider other cultures to be superior because we see members as wiser and more spiritual than us. Wait a minute, why is this ethnocentric? We're looking up to these people, but at the same time, we're stereotyping, making sweeping cultural judgments. Of course, ethnocentrism does have its uses. It can promote a coherent worldview, proper behavior, 
in group solidarity. It can also help to conserve wealth within the group. In other words, if you view others as inferior, you don't need to share wealth with them. It can also mobilize people for warfare. But an ethnocentric bias short circuits the learning process by explaining all cultural problems or misunderstandings as someone else's failures, you make it impossible for yourself to expand your own worldview. You become trapped in your own culturally shaped system. The position we want to advocate is both ethical and productive is a relativist position. Relativism suggests suspending moral and practical judgments until you know enough to make a reasoned assessment Taking a relativistic stance is to recognize that despite their differences, the people you're dealing with are human beings like any others. Two points follow from this. First, however strange or unpredictable they seem to you, their actions must have meanings that help them understand their place in the universe. Second, people's actions must serve reasonable, practical functions to keep their society working. In other words, on some level, cultural practices usually work. In cultural anthropology, our goal is to try to understand how they work. The alternative is to learn from intercultural encounters, expanding your worldview so that you meet each new intercultural encounter with a broader toolkit. By encounter, I mean any situation in which persons or groups from different cultural backgrounds encounter their differences. This can occur across obvious linguistic and cultural barriers, but it can also occur within a wider community. Such encounters can provide what we call a rich point, that is, a departure from the participants' expectations that signals a cultural difference. Rich points can give direction to learning. Rich points are events or misunderstandings that have been experienced as embarrassing, irritating, funny, strange, or problematic, and that can serve as entry points into exploring cultural differences. The learner might discuss the incident with other members of the culture to try to get additional perspectives to help refine the schema. For example, in eating Christmas in the Kalahari, Richard Lee was frustrated when the boom made fun of the ox he planned to give them. This served as a rich point that provided cultural insight into how the boom used ridicule to enforce equality. Later, he asked people, and they explained to him what they had been doing. When we encounter a rich point and do not dismiss it by taking an ethnocentric position, we can form a tentative model or schema about the culture they are trying to understand. We can then test the schema against additional rich points. In most cases, we must modify our schema to accommodate what we learn at each encounter. Eventually, however, we develop a sufficiently complex and coherent model.